Uh, welcome everybody to the Wednesday seminar this week, uh, which is uh, by Zachary Schutholz from the ANU. Uh, as we begin, I'd like to acknowledge that we're meeting on Ngunnawal and Ngambri country, the traditional custodians of this land. And this project and the broader Exploring for the Future program uh, look at uh, studying the entire continent. So we pay our respects uh, to elders of those lands and any who may be joining us today. Now, uh, Zach's going to give us a talk on the petrological and geophysical constraints on the architecture, lithology and geochemistry of Australia's lithospheric mantle. That's a long term. Effectively, we're mapping the architecture of the Australian tectonic plate. The reason Zach uh, is collaborating with us in the Exploring for the Future program is because over the last decade or so, we've been imaging the architecture of the Australian tectonic plates to depths of tens to hundreds of kilometres. We know that the features that we see down there are exceedingly important to narrow the exploration search space for new resources. Yet the question keeps coming up from industry and others, what is it that we are seeing? So to do that, we need to be able to calibrate what we're imaging from these remote techniques like OSLAMP and OSARAY with rocks. And Zach is going to tell us how we do that using Nature Earth to bring them up to the surface. Now, Zach, uh, Zach is exceedingly good and exceedingly productive at what he does. Uh, he holds a Bachelor of Science from Monash uh, and honours from University of Western Australia. He has also spent time in exploration in Queensland, and he started a PhD uh, here at the ANU and finished it in 2022, I think it was. Is that right, Zach? Yeah. And since then, uh, he's been continuing with us uh, uh, on a postdoc um, collaboration, uh, focusing on bringing in these constraints. So without further ado, I want to welcome Zach to the stage uh, uh, to um, take us through this topic. Thank you. Perfect. Uh, well, thanks, Carol, for the introduction and to GSUN Australia for hosting me today. Um, before I begin, I'll just start by acknowledging that a lot of the work I'm presenting today is, um, has been done through funding uh, in part by Exploring for the Future. So the work I'm going to talk about today is um, has been part of an ongoing collaboration between the Research School of Earth Sciences and the Exploring for the Future program that started in 2018. Uh, the work I'm going to particularly talk about is, um, as Carol mentioned, on focusing on the architectural lithology and geochemistry of the Australian lithospheric mantle, predominantly using natural mantle xenoliths. Uh, obviously, um, coming from a five-year collaboration, it's very difficult to explain everything in um, in considerable detail. But I'll I'll provide snapshots of a few of the a few of the highlights and be more than happy to discuss further afterwards or answer any emails um, in the coming days. So most people here will be familiar with the lithospheric mantle. Um, it's the part of Earth's rigid um, outer shell that occurs with a thickness of about 80 to 300 kilometers beneath continents. The lithospheric mantle is comprised predominantly of a, a rock called peridotite, which is an ultra, it's an ultra, ultra mafic rock, um, rich in olivine, as well as variable other uh, minerals, including orthoperoxine and clinoperoxine and garnet and spinel, depending on the pressure. Now, it goes without saying, um, the lithospheric mantle plays a really important role in a number of uh, processes that operate on Earth. Um, for example, uh, the climate is greatly controlled from the lithospheric mantle from the subduction and storage of carbon-rich sediments in the mantle, as well as the eruption of volcanic gases at converted margins. Uh, additionally, a lot of the metals we mine at the surface start off in the lithospheric mantle, and it's only through melting and tectonic processes that these are transported and concentrated at the surface to form water deposits. So within Australia, the lithospheric mantle has been a major research focus and exploration focus for the past decade, um, largely because of the role it plays in the distribution and formation of water deposits. So a lot of the work that's been done on the lithospheric mantle has focused on, uh, we benefited from geophysical data sets. Uh, for example, seismic tomography and seismic receive functions have showed us that the lithospheric architecture and lithospheric thickness play a really important role in the distribution of various copper lead zinc deposits. Additionally, uh, the electrical, well, the resistivity and conductivity of the upper mantle and lower crust uh, has been a major focus through magnetotellurics, and that's shown us that the composition and metasomatic history of the mantle also play a really important role um, in the formation and distribution of, of various water deposits, including Olympic Dam, 
Um, now, obviously, these are just a couple of examples of, of many data sets um, that have considerably improved our understanding of the Littlejack mantle. Um, going forward, however, um, we really require access to natural data sets to be able to test these observations and validate them, but also calibrate them, which is largely the focus of this talk. So the best way to study the Littrack mantle using natural samples is through kimberlites. Uh, so kimberlites are a, a unique kind of rock that form deep within the asthenosphere and travel to the surface within a matter of hours. And during their rapid ascent to the surface, they pick up pieces of the mantle, which we refer to as mantle zenoliths, and there's a few of those there. Now, mantle zenoliths are really useful because they provide snapshots of the Littrack mantle from where that kimberlite came from. And obviously, if we collect enough mantle zenoliths from a single kimberlite eruption, we can essentially study the entire um, column where that, that kimberlite sampled. And obviously, mantle zenoliths provide important information of the composition of the mantle, but also the mineralogy and another other number of other uh, properties. So to be able to work out, well, the major part of studying the Littrack mantle using mantle zenoliths is being able to work out where that mantle zenolith came from. And to do that, we use a technique called geothermobarometry, which is essentially the science of measuring the pressure and temperature histories of a rock and mineral. Uh, so geothermobarometry is built on the basis that the chemical composition of the upper mantle varies substantially as a function of pressure and temperature. And a lot of that chemical, the pressure and temperature chemical variation in the mantle is accommodated by the exchange of various cations between the minerals that make up the mantle. So a nice example is the temperature dependent exchange of iron and magnesium between the various silicates that make up the mantle. Now, importantly, when mantle zenoliths are picked up by kimberlites and they're brought to the surface rapidly, this temperature and pressure dependent chemical variability in these rocks is essentially frozen, which means that we can go to any volcano around Australia and pick up a mantle zenolith. We can take it to the lab and, and reliably work out where in that, the upper mantle that mantle zenolith was derived from, um, which is extremely important and useful. So a major part of this project, which I'm not going to talk about too much here today, is the, is the calibration of geothermobarometers. So the development of techniques that we can use to be able to reliably work out the pressure and temperature that these samples came from. Uh, so up until a few years ago, the geothermobarometers available for studying mantle samples were, were poorly calibrated and subject to really large uncertainties, which would uh, inhibit the confident application to mantle drive samples from across Australia. So as a part of this calibration, we, we spent almost two years doing experiments calibrating new geothermobarometers we could reliably apply to samples from across Australia to reconstruct lift stroke profiles. There's been a large focus on single grain geothermobarometers, so, so geothermobarometers that can be applied to single grains of clinoproxene or garnet or olivine, and that's largely because most of the mantle zenoliths from across Australia are heavily eroded and occur as, as heavy mineral concentrates. So to calibrate the geothermobarometers, we conducted a number of high temperature, high pressure experiments using various sintered synthed, um, chemical powders that represent the diversity of chemical compositions across the mantle of Australia. Uh, those powders were subject to high pressure and high temperatures where, where we would synthesize small pieces of the upper mantle. And over a number of different experiments at different pressures and temperatures and compositions, we'd monitor those com chemical compositions in the synthesized rocks uh, to be able to work out how the composition varies as a function of pressure and temperature. And that is essentially the basis of geothermobarometry. Um, so I'll be here all day if I was going to talk about the geothermobarometers, but as a part of this collaboration, we have managed to establish four new uh, geothermobarometry techniques that can be applied to mantle zenoliths across Australia. And this is extremely important because it means that we can now go to mantles, collect mantle zenoliths from across Australia and reliably reconstruct their pressures and temperatures. So the main focus of this talk and the main fo focus of the, the collaboration was applying the mantle zenoliths to mantle zenoliths from across, the, across Australia. Um, so over a five-year period, we've, we had collected over 20,000 uh, mantle zenoliths and heavy, heavy mineral concentrate samples from, from kimberlites and related volcanic rocks across Australia. Uh, these include samples for, these include um, zenoliths and heavy mineral concentrate from more than 50 different volcanoes. And this is uh, done both through field work, but also um, collaboration with colleagues in ex exploration, but also in uh, the state surveys and museums. And the main purpose is to use our new geothermobarometer calibrations to these mantle zenolith samples to provide constraints on the architecture, lithology, and geochemistry of the mantle across Australia. So the geothermobarometry pressure and temperature estimates on mantle zenoliths essentially tell us three main pieces of information about the lift here. Firstly, and probably most importantly, that we can use the pressure and temperature array defined by individual pressure and temperature estimates as shown on this 
here, you know, the, the small dots there. Uh, those each individual in, represent an individual pressure and temperature on a, a mantle sample. So we can use that array and fit a geotherm to that. And where that geotherm intersects the mantle isenotrope, the vertical line on the figure there, gives us a robust estimate of the, the paleo lithosphere asthenosphere boundary, the, the thickness of lithosphere. Now, in the context of Australia and geoscience, and geoscience Australia in particular, this is really important because those lithospheric thickness estimates are used to feed into models um, like this one here from, from Hogarth et al, which, which shows us how the lithospheric thickness of Australia greatly influences the distribution of, of copper lead zinc deposits. So in the original model made by Hogarth et al, they used approximately 10 zine lift locations to help calibrate this model. Um, as part of this collaboration, we've managed to extend the number of samples to over 50, um, including more than 20,000 samples, which when, that, when we incorporate these new lift stroke thickness estimates into this model, it greatly improves the resolution and helps highlight some fine scale structures, uh, which may prove to be important uh, regions for ore exploration. Secondly, we can use a composition of various minerals or whole rocks to reconstruct the lithology. Uh, so Ghana in particular, um, records its host composition quite reliably. So if we can calculate the pressure and temperature of mantle xenocris of, of garnet or the whole rock, uh, we can essentially reconstruct how the composition or the lithology of the mantle changes as a function of depth. And that's quite important when we compare those observations with geophysical data sets to work out what is the cause of numerous conductors or anomalous seismic velocities. Finally, and, and, and perhaps equally importantly, is is the reconstruction of the stratigraphy of the, the mantle in terms of the chemistry. So we can use the pressure and temperature of individual minerals or whole rocks and compare and, and plot also the, the composition and see how the composition of those, those minerals and rocks changes with the function of depth. In this particular example, we have um, each of these individual dots represents a clinoperoxene um, from the upper mantle and it has the depth of that sample is derived from and the change in, in various chemical parameters. And, uh, this is really important because it can tell us for, for metal for elements like nickel cobalt and and various other ones we can see where certain reserves are where that are hosting um, metal accumulations in the mantle so for the next 15 20 minutes i'm going to be talking about the application of these new techniques um, these geothermal barometry techniques to mantle drive samples mantle xenocrist in particular from across the, across the gall of craton in south australia so most of you will be familiar with the Gola Craton. Um, it is the one of the main cratonic uh, constituents of the South Australian Craton, uh, occurring next to the Kernamona province and Kumpana block. Uh, the Gola Craton and South Australian Craton as a whole records a number of, of complex tectonic, metamorphic and, and magmatic events that span from the Archean to the Mesoproterozoic. However, main major tectonic events occurred during uh, 1500 to 1600 million years ago when the region is thought to have cratonized. Um, and obviously this period was quite important for the formation of a number of mineral systems as well, including Olympic Dam. Um, importantly for this study, the South Australian craton and Gaula craton have been very well studied over the past few years, uh, predominantly from magnetic tellurics and seismic tomography from uh, work done both at GA, but also from colleagues at the Geological Survey of, of South Australia. And this data provides an excellent framework to be able to compare some of our observations um, based on mantle analysts with geophysical data sets. So the, South, the, the Gaula Craton is an exceptional location to be able to study the mantle because it hosts a large number of kimberlites, uh, many of which contain mantle xenoliths and single grain xenocryst. Kimberlites occur in eight provinces across the Craton, uh, spanning from right on the, on the Gaula Craton across the Adelaide Fold Belt and to the far eastern margin of the South Australian Craton. The majority of kimberlites were formed in the Jurassic, um, thought to be in response to the early stages of, of the break of uh, Gondwana. In this study, we've, we've used over 10,000 uh, mantle xenocrysts, so single grains of garnet and clinoproxene derived from the mantle, which we've collected from kimberlites and bulk samples of the kimberlites. With the motivation of constraining and studying the architecture, lithology and geochemistry of the mantle beneath this region. So I showed on the previous slide that we can use the pressure and temperature estimates of, of various, the mantle minerals or mantle xenoliths and reconstruct paleogeotherms. So for the Gaula Craton, we've managed to construct uh, paleogeotherms from a number of locations across the Craton, which provide important information of how the lithospheric thickness changes um, across, across the region. So on the Gaula Craton um, on the Air Peninsula, the, the paleogeotherm and, and lithosphere sensitive boundary, the LAB, is constrained uh, from clinoperoxene pressure and temperature estimates at Mount Hope uh, on the Air Peninsula. And here we can see that the lift sphere is approximately where the, the paleogeotherm intersects the mantle isenotrope is approximately 200 kilometers. 
uh, this estimate of the lithosphere boundary is consistent with the cratonic setting that these kimberlites occur in uh, and is reasonably uh, in good agreement with most recent tomography data sets as well. Moving towards the northeast, uh, the paleo geotherms here are constrained by kimberlite from, from clinoproxene pressure and temperature estimates at uh, kimberlite province in the Port Augusta region and also Euralia. Here we can see that the LAB, the lithosphere sensory boundary, is extended to slightly greater depths, um, highlighting a lithosphere thickness of about 220 kilometres. Uh, these thicknesses are, are slightly greater than most current tomography data sets, um, but are, in, are consistent with the presence of diamond, particularly within the Euralia province. Uh, the occurrence of, of thick lithosphere, particularly beneath Euralia, um, is quite interesting because, at least based on present thinking, this Kimberlite province is meant to have placed in place into the Adelaide fold belt. So the occurrence of such thick lithosphere beneath this region suggests that possibly the Gaula Craton, at least the eastern margin of the Gaula Craton, probably persists uh, further east subsurface. Uh, in the Adelaide fold belt, um, the lithosphere thermosphere boundary is constrained from a number of, of Kimberlite province in the Tarawi region. Um, and these, these um, paleo geotherms highlight lithosphere thermosphere boundaries that extend from about 140 kilometres to 175 kilometres. Um, and in this region here, we can we can see there's quite a diversity in terms of the lift strike structure. Uh, these paleo geotherms, the, the complex architecture here is consistent with the presence of both diamniferous and, and barren kimblites within this region. So uh, there's possibly some complex, complex architecture within this region that needs to be resolved from, from other methods. Um, the, the far eastern margin of the Gaul, the South Australian Craton is constrained by paleo geotherms at the Whitecliffs region. Here we can we can get a pretty good estimate of the current uh, boundary of the South Australian Craton, which is positioned at about 150 kilometres depth. So we can get an idea of the, the composition of the upper mantle by looking at how the pressure and temperature estimates vary. Um, well, the, how, how the, um, the amount of pressure and temperature estimates vary. So on these histograms here, we've got the number of clinoproxene and garnet grains and the depth that they were derived from. And what we can see is that within the shallow lift sphere, we've got um, an abundant population of clinoproxene and garnet pressure estimates that range from about 40 kilometres to 110. Within the middle lift sphere, between about 100 and 110 kilometres to 140, we've got a very clear decrease in the amount of samples, garnet and clinoproxene samples derived from this region, implying either that this region was poorly sampled um, when the kimblites were, were transversing to the surface, or this region is uh, comprised of lithologies, rocks that are anomalously depleted in garnet and clinoproxene. Within the deep lift sphere, beyond about 140 kilometres, we can see that the mantle contains a lot of samples that return pressure and temperature, well, a lot of garnets that return pressure and temperature estimates between 140 to the base of the lift sphere at about 210. Uh, also from this region, there is an abundant population of clinoproxene. Um, you can't see them as well on this histogram here, but when we look at the paleo geotherms, we can see that uh, pretty much all these locations ranging from the Gaula Craton all the way across to uh, far the far eastern margin have bimodal distributions where we have a, an abundant population of clinoproxene within the shallow lift sphere. We have an apparent gap between about 100, 100 to 140 kilometres depth where we have no clinoproxene sampled, and then another population slightly smaller within the deep lift sphere, uh, which is quite interesting, um, implying that there is some sort of complex um, variation in the, the sampling or the lithology within the mantle. Clues to what is going on within the middle lift between this region where we've apparently got a depleted zone um, comes from geophysical data sets. So uh, Skiro and others did a, quite a detailed traverse in terms of the magnetic tellurics, but also the tomography um, of the Gaula Craton a few years ago and found that at a very similar depth region um, to where we have this clinoproxene depleted layer, there is an anomalously, uh, anomalously seismically slow layer um, at about a, a very similar depth that extends right across the entire Craton, which is quite interesting. Um, Skiro and others interpret this layer uh, as some sort of peroxonite or orthoperoxonite, which I guess is an observation that's consistent with our observations that this region has uh, seemingly lower amounts of clinoperoxene. The low seismic velocities that are associated with this layer, this anomalous horizon within the middle lift sphere, have also been um, imaged using receive functions. Uh, so this is some receive functions, SP receive functions from Ford, Ford et al. And uh, these, these are various stations from the Gaula Craton. We can see uh, for this one in particular, uh, BB double O, that there is a quite a prominent negative phase at about 130, 140 kilometres depth. And this obviously agrees quite well with 
the observations of Skiro and also our petrological data, that within the mid-list beneath the Gawler Craton, there seems to be some sort of anomalous, seismically slow, but also lithologically uh, anomalous region. So further insight into the anomalous nature and stratified nature of the Gawler Craton comes from when we look at how the chemical composition of clinoproxine varies as a function of depth. So here, each of these represent clinoproxine estimates, clinoproxine pressure and temperature estimates from a number of different locations across the Gawler Craton. We can see that the chemical composition, chemical composition varies quite substantially as we go from the shallow lift sphere between about 50 to 100 kilometres. Uh, we have that gap in the mid lift sphere, and then again, that population within the deep lift sphere. So in general, we, we get, can see that the shallow lift sphere is comprised of clinoproxine with quite low iron and titanium concentrations uh, and quite elevated land, uh, light reverse, as we can see on the, the lantern down the bottom there, uh, second from the right. Uh, this, this shallow lift sphere also seems to be quite depleted in heavy rare earth, which I'll show on the following slide. The deep lift sphere shows much the opposite trends. It has quite depleted light rare earths, as we can see down the bottom there with the yellow points uh, for lanthanum. It's less depleted or slightly more enriched in light rare earths, uh, heavy rare earths, and it has elevated titanium and iron concentrations. So the, 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 the results from here show that these two, the two layers within the shallow and deep lift sphere, which are separated by this anomalous lithologically diverse or lithological anomalous mid lift sphere layer that has an absence of clinoproxene and seismically slow layers is separating two very distinct layers within the lift sphere beneath the Gawler Craton. So further, further um, evidence of this diverse nature of the shallow lift sphere comes from these rare valent plots here where we can see that um, as discussed in the previous slide, uh, the, the yellow, the green points are um, which have come from the shallow lift sphere have quite depleted heavy reefs and, and enriched light reefs. Um, and the opposite trend is observed for, for uh, the deep lift sphere. So based on the opposite, the, the compositions of clinoproxene um, and the seismic data, we, it's clearly obvious that the South Australian craton uh, is quite unique and it's, it's lithologically and chemically stratified. So in general, the shallow lift sphere records a range of compositions, including refertilized and refractory, um, with a number of different lithologies, which I haven't talked about in detail here, but include lurzlites and whirlites. This strong um, depletion in, in iron, particularly the clinoproxene from this layer, um, suggests that it may have initially been quite depleted and represents the refractory nucleus that the Gawler Craton has probably grown from. The, a lot of the modification of this region in terms of its light roof enrichment um, perhaps comes from modification of, of kimberlite and carbon type melts. Perhaps the most important part for this region though is this anomalous region within the mid lift sphere that uh, is depleted in clinoproxene and to gu and garnet to a lesser extent. And clearly this is some sort of anomalous lithological horizon. The deep lift sphere um, has slightly less clinoproxene as we saw from those histograms. Um, the absence of clinoproxene suggests it is probably slightly more refractory or, or depleted. Uh, and it has very strong enrichments in titanium and iron, uh, which are probably attributed to metasomatism or modification from being so close to the asthenosphere. Perhaps the most important thing is though that such different chemical compositions between the shallow and deep lift sphere suggest that these two parts of the lift sphere have very different metasomatic um, and also uh, magmatic histories. Uh, so it's probably very likely that the shallow lift sphere, the shallow lift sphere reason rep represents probably the earliest nuclei of the South Australian Craton, and it's only been through large-scale melting and, and metasomatism that it has caused the bottom layer to essentially grow from the top down. Um, obviously, I can't talk about this in the extreme amount of detail, but for those that are interested, I'm more than happy to discuss in person, or you can have a look at the, um, the manuscript that's been out for a while. So for the second part of the talk, I'm going to be talking about the, the Kimberley Craton. Um, using much the similar techniques to, as to what was uh, we've done for the the Gawler Craton. So the Gawler Craton, the Kimberley Craton, is not as well studied, um, at least recently, in comparison to the Gawler Craton. Uh, nonetheless, it, it is one of the main cratonic nuclei that makes up the South Australian Craton. It records a number of of complex tectonic, metamorphic, and magmatic events that span most of the Proterozoic. Uh, however, major major events occurred between 800 to, 1800 to 1900 million years ago when a series of island arcs were accreted onto the, the margins of the Kimberley Craton and it was amalgamated with the North Australian Craton. These include the Halls Creek origins and the, the King Leopold origins. Uh, the Kimberley Craton is probably most well known for the 
the Diamond Interest deposits that it contains, including Argyle and Allendale, uh, but is also prospective for a number of other commodities, including nickel, cobalt, uh, gold, platinum, palladium. So the Kimberley Craton is also a really fantastic location to be able to study using mantles and lists because it contains an abundance of kimberlites and lamperites, many of which contain mantles and lists and single grain xenocris. The kimberlite and lamperite pipes across the Gaul, the Costa Kimberley Craton are hosted in, in four main provinces in the north, east, central and west. Uh, unlike the Gaula Craton, which had magnetism predominantly occurring during the Jurassic, here, magnetism has occurred, kimberlite magnetism has occurred during four periods, which include the Mesoproterozoic, Neoproterozoic, Triassic, and Miocene. And such a large range in terms of like in terms of um, temporal variation in, in terms of magnetism provides a tremendous opportunity to be able to study how the chemistry, but also architecture of the, the region has changed over time, but also space. For this study, we've we've used over 10,000 mantles increase and diamond inclusions, which have been collected from the kimberlites and, and halt on bulk, bulk rock samples from, from the kimberlites and lamperites. Again, the main motivation for this study is to constrain the lithology, geochemistry and architecture of the Livestreck mantle beneath the region. So similar to the Gaula Craton, we can use the pressure and temperature estimates from uh, individual clinoperoxene grains or whole xenoliths to try and reconstruct the geotherm or paleo geotherms and paleo lithosphere boundary estimates from across the region. Uh, in general, the Lystria beneath the beneath the Kimberley Craton uh, is is consistent with the cratonic setting and and really doesn't vary too much, um, both with space but also time. So estimates of the Paleo Lystria sensitive boundary during the Mesoproterozoic are constrained by pressure and temperature estimates at Argyle, which was in place at about 1,200 million years ago. And here we can see that. The lift stroke thinnest boundary is positioned at about 230 kilometres. Uh, this estimate is slightly thicker than previous estimates, which is largely due to the application and usage of, of new updated geothermal barometry techniques. The thick lift stroke this region is consistent, however, with the presence of diamond, um, and it differs slightly from, from current and previous tomography results, which I'll get into shortly. The Paleo lithosphere sensitive boundary for the Neoproterozoic is constrained by pressure and temperature estimates on mantle xenoliths, in particular, clinoproxene xenocris from the North Kimberley region. And here we can see that the Paleo LAB is constrained at about 245 kilometres, uh, implying that across uh, between the, the East Kimberley and also the North Kimberley, there's very little change in lithosphere thickness, and also between the Mesoproterozoic and Neo, Neo, Mesoproterozoic. And Neoproterozoic. Uh, which basically suggests that there's very little change in the stroke thickness across the region. Uh, the most recent period of, of magnetism occurred during the Miocene when a bulk of the uh, West Kimberley lamperites were, were intruded into the lower crust, into the crust. Here we've got pressure and temperature estimates from individual clinoproxene um, from a number of different pipes, and each of these uh, highlight a paleo lift stress injury boundary of about 250 to 230 kilometres depth. Again, implying that there's been very little change in lithospheric architecture across the Kimberley Craton uh, for the past 1.2 million years. Importantly, the fact that these kimberlites were well, these lamperites were in place only 20 million years ago provides a pretty good framework as to what we would expect the current lithosphere sensitive boundary to be beneath the region. Um, so our results for the Kimberley are in contrast with recent seismic tomography results from Delat et al, who recently published the Oz22 model for the region. Uh, beneath their, in their model, uh, beneath the Kimberley, they have anomalously thin, uh, croton well, anomalously thin lift sphere, which is positioned the LAB at about 160 kilometres, um, which is obviously uh, in considerable disagreement with the observations that we've made using um, mantle xenolith mantle from the Kimberlites in the West Kimberley. So considering these observations, um, the LAB estimates constrained from the petrological data sets position the LAB at about 250 kilometres, uh, whereas here the LAB is positioned at about 160 kilometres, implying that there's somehow been the removal of about 80 kilometres of, of lithosphere between a 20 million period. Now there's a number of explanations um, for this. For example, one particular explanation that, that the Latital uh, subscribed to is from the lithosphere erosion. Um, from a plume since the Miocene. Um, this is I somewhat hard to, hard to um, I guess, agree with, given that uh, magnetism only occurred 20 million years ago. So this would imply uh, an erosion rate of more than four, four kilometers per million years since these uh, kimberlites were erupted. 
Additionally, uh, the Australian plate has been moving northward uh, rapidly, so this would imply that the, the plume head would be positioned somewhere within Western Australia. Um, and there's really no evidence of, of a plume beneath this region um, or the removal of such a large quantity of, of lift stroke mantle. Perhaps uh, the most likely explanation for the disagreement between our petrological observations and these seismic observations comes from the removal of one of the key stations within the region, the, the Fitzroy Trough Station. Uh, so in their model, um, they acknowledge that including or removing that station has a very strong influence on the re results that they get. Um, at least based on our observations, it seems to it seems that including this station is probably more more likely to give a, a closer agreement between the petrological observations and uh, the observations from from seismic data sets. So similar to the Gawler Craton, um, we can use the distribution of pressure and temperature estimates throughout the, the lithosphere to understand how the lithology of the mantle varies as a function of depth. In general, we can see from the shallow lithosphere between about 50 to 100 kilometres, we have quite an abundant population of climate peroxine. Within this same region, there's very few garnet that were, were, were collected, um, and this may be due to the presence of, of spinel rather than garnet, which I'll get to shortly. The mid lithosphere um, is anomalously depleted in clinoproxen again. So a similar observation to which we made for the Gawler Craton, uh, this region between about 100 to 150 kilometres has a surprisingly anomalously um, low amount of clinoproxen, which is sampled from that region. The deep lithosphere from about 150 kilometres to the base of the lithosphere at about 250 kilometres depth is comprised of large populations of both garnet and clinoproxen, which we can see here. And those, the bimodal distribution of, of clinoproxen um, between the shallow and deep lift is also quite apparent when we have a look at those, the paleogeotherms again, where we can see for a number of these locations, particularly in the, the West Kimberley, we can see that they've got these shallow and deep populations which are which are quite prominent with this absence of sampling within the mid lift sphere. So further evidence of, or further uh, insight into what is causing this anomalous depletion or whether it is real comes from uh, seismic data sets, in particular receiver functions. So recent receiver functions from Berkeley et al. Uh, in 2021 show that for the Fitzroy trough, which is, occurs nearby to these Kimberlites, there is a very anomalous negative phase uh, at a similar depth interval within the middle of the at about 130, 120 kilometres depth. Uh, and this, this strong negative amplitude agrees quite well with the absence of climate peroxin, which we agreed with. Um, there seems to be class, a, quite a close agreement there. There is also a, quite a strong negative phase at 230 to 250 kilometers depth, and this probably agrees with the depth of the lithosphere central boundary from our petrological data sets. So further insight into, into what is the, the, the stratified nature of the, the Gawler Craton, uh, the Kimberley Craton, sorry, comes from the distribution uh, of different chemical compositions as a function of depth. So we can see that the shallow lithosphere clinoperoxine are comprised of, of quite um, rich, aluminium and calcium concentrations. Um, again, this, this region is probably um, associated with the stability of, of spinel rather than garnet. The mid lithosphere, similar to what we saw with the Gawler Craton, has an a, a lower abundance of clinoperoxene and has a really quite a strong chemical inflection that takes place between the composition within the shallow lithosphere and deep lithosphere. So that is that the chemical composition of the shallow lithosphere um, and deep lithosphere are, are very unique and very different. And that separation between the two different layers occurs at that mid lithospheric depth. The chemical composition of the deep lithosphere is, is quite unique and quite anomalous in that it's enriched and elevated in titanium, uh, potassium and iron and, and quite depleted uh, in aluminium. And these trends are observed right across the entire, entire craton. Uh, similar, similar anomalously stratified nature of the, the Kimberley craton um, is seen in the trace elements. So we can see from uh, in, the, in the shallow lithosphere, clinoproxenes are containing slightly elevated or less depleted uh, heavier earths and notably lower uh, light earths, as shown by the, the lanthanum viterbium uh, plot down there. Again, mid lithosphere is very is anomalously depleted. The deep lithosphere has the opposite trends to the shallow lithosphere in that it's, it's elevated in light earths and middle earths and less depleted um, in, or well, more depleted slightly in heavier earths, as we can see the sort of slightly higher. Um, lanthanum turbine plots down there. Again, these trends are observed right across the entire craton. And, and it basically implies that the lithosphere beneath this region is, is strongly stratified and, and has very different um, shallow and deep lithospheric origins. Uh, the, the 
distribution of, of light rare earths and heavy rare earths in the climate peroxins again is shown from these uh, these plots here, where we can see that the squares and the diamonds, which represent samples from the deep lithosphere, have quite elevated light rare earths um, and slightly more depleted heavy rare earths, whereas the samples from the shallow lithosphere have um, less well, less enriched and slightly more depleted light rare earths uh, and flat uh, heavy rare earth enrichments. And, and this flat rare earth pattern is probably attributed to the fact that they equilibrate with uh, spinel because otherwise they would have slightly different heavy rare earth concentrations. So the again, we've seen from the chemical composition of the clinic peroxide that the mantle beneath the region is, is strongly stratified. The shallow sphere of the, of the Kimberley Craton probably reflects some sort of uh, refractory nucleus, which has grown from the top down, um, which would probably explain why the regions, the shallow and deep lift have such anomalous compositions. Um, a lot of the modification, modification in terms of the trace elements is probably attributed to interaction with the, the host magmas. I haven't talked talking too much about the host, host lithologies, but the composition of garnets suggests that this region is, is probably comprised mostly of, of Lurs light and some minor amounts of eclogite. The mid lithosphere is clearly depleted in clinoproxin, as we've seen again, similar to the Gola craton. Uh, and, it, and this is, seems to be some sort of anomalous lithological horizon that's separating very different chemical layers in the shallow and deep lithosphere. The deep lithosphere, in contrast, is, is considerably more depleted. I haven't spoken about here, but it's comprised a lot of, of Hasbergites, which are quite depleted in, in clinoproxin and, and have been melt depleted. The strong light rare enrichment in this region is probably due, and enrichment in potassium is probably due to modification from subducted sediments, um, probably which occurred during the between 1800 to 1600 million years when a lot of those island darks were accreted onto the region. The region, this region also has, this deep lithosphere also has quite strong um, modification from asphenospheric melts, explained by the high iron and also titanium. So, for the We've spoken quite a lot about this clinoproxene depleted layer within the mid lithosphere that um, contains obviously quite depleted anomalous, anomalously low clinoproxene. And we've seen this across both the Gaula craton and Kimberley craton. And it seems that this layer is, is quite closely associated with, with negative seismic velocities. So for the next uh, 10 or so minutes, I'm going to basically explore um, what is the probably likely origins of this anomalous region within the mantle across Australia. So mantle xenoliths uh, from across Australia, um, here we've spoken about the Gaula craton and, and Kimberley craton, but mantle xenoliths from across Australia constantly um, show us that the mid lithosphere between about 80 to 140 kilometres depth is comprised of anomalously low abundance of clinoproxene. For regions where there is permanent st seismic stations nearby, uh, we can see that this region is also comprised of, of quite anomalously slow seismic velocities. And the abundance of samples that we have from across Australia and also this, the, the seismic data allows us to sort of explore this anomalous layer in a bit more detail. So the negative velocities that occur within the mid lithosphere has been, um, has been referred to as the mid lithosphere discontinuity, and it's attracted uh, quite a lot of research interest over the past few years. So the MLD for short has been observed um, not just beneath Australia, but also South America, North America, uh, India, um, as well as Africa. Uh, typically between a depth uh, similar to where we have this clinoproxene depleted layer at about 60 to 140 kilometres depth, with the majority of, of MLDs observed at about 100 kilometres depth. Now, this region is very poorly understood, but there's been a number of, of workers that have, have tried to provide, will have proposed explanations for this, this anomalous region of the mantle, including layers of partial melt, uh, anisotropy, uh, eclogite, uh, subducted slabs, uh, and the accumulation of metasomatic minerals, notably uh, amphibole or a type of amphibole called pargosite. Now, the amphibole or pargosite model for the mid lithosphere discontinuity has, has received quite a lot of petrological support because there's a number of properties of amphibole that provide a really good agreement with some of the observations that have been made using geophysical data sets. Uh, so most importantly is that the, the stability of pargosite, amph uh, pargositic amphibole in the upper mantle is controlled by the dehydration solidus. Um, so here we have a, a phase diagram where we've got pressure and depth, uh, pressure and temperature, and the dehydration solidus is shown on that, that pink line there. And the, the dehydration solidus basically uh, reflects where, where pargosite is stable enough mantle. So within the, within the dehydration solidus, so within this region here, pargosite is stable. Whereas when we jump to the when we jump to the other side of the solidus, it is not stable. 
Now, pygocyte is, is a, a major water storage mineral in Alpha Mantle. Um, it is uh, it for so pygocyte is a, is a major water storing mineral in the Alpha Mantle, and essentially the dehydration solidus reflects a an important region of, of where we go from basically having water stored within within pargasite within the dehydration solids to water being stored in in non-aqueous minerals or in in various other low modal abundance minerals the important thing about the dehydration solids is this this bottom region down here where it's written pargasite in pargasite out and that region there as you can see is quite flat and now it's quite important because it essentially represents this horizontal discontinuity in the upper mantle where we go from having water stored in pargasite um, in, in the shallow region to water being distributed in non-aqueous minerals or, or partitioned into melt. So it's a really quite important discontinuity or petrological discontinuity where we can essentially store pargasite at that dehydrated solidus. And if we move a little bit lower, uh, it is not stable. So perhaps the most important feature is that pargasite is very rare in the upper mantle uh, and it only forms when we react water uh, with clinoproxing lows light, clinoproxing being lows light. So we know from a number of experiments been, which have been done over the past um, several decades that the best, the most productive way of forming pargocyte is, is reacting water with clinoproxene. And this experiment data essentially shows that where we've got pre, uh, experiments that are done at, at similar depths to this pargocyte in, pargocyte out um, discontinuity or, or phase transition, where you have modal abundance of pargocyte on the y axis and modal abundance of clinoproxene on the, on the x axis. And you can see that they're both closely correlated. So for experiments and, and rocks where we have quite a lot of pargocyte, we have lower abundance of clinoproxene, which uh, is quite important. So the the most um, so the important thing is that that the pargocyte um, is forming at the dehydration solids probably when we have some sort of low volume melts or low volume fluids uh, that are traveling up. And if those melts are traveling up and and cross this pargocyte, um, pargocyte dehydration solidus, the water from those melts and, and fluids is immediately trapped into uh, pargocytes and amphiboles, uh, where, which would in nature would be would result in this sort of horizontal layer in the upper mantle where we have just this accumulation of, of pargocyte and amphibole where those waters and melts have crossed that dehydration solidus. Now we see, as I explained before, that pargocyte is forming from the breakdown of clinoproxene. So what we end up having, having is this layer within the upper mantle where we have pargocyte forming and clinoproxene breaking down. And because pargocyte is a major water bearing mineral in the upper mantle and we're concentrating it extensively with this, this dehydration solidus, we can reduce the seismic velocities quite substantially, but also explain the absence of clinoproxene at a similar depth interval from where we're forming it. So the most likely explanation is that, as I said before, is that you have these water bearing melts and fluids that are percolating up or rising up from the deep lift here, um, either from subduction zones or from the LAB, which we know happens from, from observations on natural data sets. As these fluids and, and melts uh, travel up, um, up the mantle, percolate up, once they cross that isobaric, that horizontal layer um, of the dehydration solidus, the water is immediately captured and stored into, into pargocyte, into amphibole. And the reaction that's forming that clino, uh, that amphibole is, is consuming clinoproxene. So we're having a depleted, we're forming this depleted layer of clinoproxene and forming pargocyte in its expense. And importantly, because that layer, that, that uh, pargocyte in reaction is, is isobaric, it's flat, we end up having this flat horizontal channels of a pargocyte in the mid uh, Now, obviously, the, thick, the thickness of this pargocyte bearing layer um, can depend largely on the water volume of, of those melts. So if we have a large volume of, of water bearing fluids and water bearing, bearing melts travel up from the LAB, uh, we, can, we can form quite thick uh, pargocyte bearing layers in the upper mantle. And obviously, um, vice versa, we can form very thin uh, MLDs or mid discontinuities from very low volume melts. So I've given a really quick snapshot of, of some of the, the work that's been done um, on the Kimberley Craton and Gawler Craton, but there's still, I guess, opportunity for a lot more uh, future work, um, particularly on the composition of, of and the timing of mantle metastomatism. So a lot of the samples that we have as part of this data set record quite complex metastomatic histories, as we've seen. A number of the samples that we have, um, you can actually see what the rock was like before and after metastomatism. And on this particular example here, we've got uh, quite a number of, of oxide, including sulfide minerals, deposited um, on the edges from when interaction with that metastomatic fluid. So that would provide quite an important insight into, into regions like the Gawler Craton, where we know mantle metastomatism played an important role in the, the formation of the various ore deposits.
Uh, the Gawler Craton has um, a fluorine problem in that a lot of the magmas that have been erupted there, including Olympic Dam, have very high fluorine, uh, but there's not really any source or explanation to where that fluorine is coming from. Um, it's very likely that it's coming from, from phases that have been melting the upper mantle, um, and these data set can provide insight into that. Um, we also have data from the Yilgarn Craton and Kilber Craton, so providing additional constraints on the LAB um, and also the lithology and geochemistry beneath that region um, is potential for future work. Um, also, we have, uh, as you can see on this figure here, quite a number of, of zoned clinoproxenes from across the Gawler Craton, which provide insight into how um, the various magmatic and metastatic fluids have, have influenced the mantle beneath the region. So other than that, um, I'll just quickly, there's a number of people, collaborators are written on there. Um, I'll just quickly thank uh, Greg Yaxley and Linton, who are the primary supervisors, and also uh, Kroll and Marcus, who are the ones that are most closely involved in this project, and obviously the Exploring for the Future program as well. So I'm more than happy to answer any questions for people that have any comments or 